please, and let's open to Genesis chapter 39. We're just a little bit behind on Wednesdays, so we're going to catch up a little bit. Let's ask God's blessing. Father, thank you so much for your word, because you, you encourage us in our faith. You strengthen us. You draw us near to yourself, and I pray that tonight you would just pour out your Holy Spirit. God, we just open our heart tonight, and we receive from you. Pour out your spirit upon us. We ask that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 39, we turn our attention to Joseph. He's one of the heroes of the faith. And uh, we first were hearing about his story back in chapter 37. We took a small, uh, there was an interesting kind of interruption, you might say, to kind of give us an insight into Judah and some of the uh, brokenness, frankly, of his life, and uh, which really gave us insight into Jesus, who came from the tribe of Judah. Very, very fascinating. If you missed it, uh, make sure you listen to it, because it's really, really important for us. But now when we get back to chapter 39, we're back to the life of Joseph. And if you remember what had happened, uh, Joseph was the favorite of the 12 sons of Jacob. He made no qualms about it. He made it very clear he was a favorite. Even gave him a, a special coat, a multicolored, uh, very colored coat that clearly stood out, made him very clearly the favorite. And the brothers hated him, very frankly, despised him for it. And then to make matters worse, he had these dreams. Now, there is much to say about dreams. And particularly when we get to these chapters here, there's a lot of interesting focus on the dreams that God uh, gives to Joseph and then to others that he then will interpret these dreams. And uh, the first dream that he had is that they were all out, you know, uh, binding sheaves and his sheaf stood upright, you know, and the others of the brothers, they all gathered round his and bowed down. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. And they didn't appreciate it. And so they told them, you know, really, really, you're going to rule over us. You think you're going to rule over us. Is that it? And uh, then he had another dream, dream number two. The sun and the moon and the 11 stars all bowed down to him. Even his father Jacob became indignant. Really? Even I'm going to bow down to you? And so that really led to animosity between the brothers. So one day when Jacob sends them out to, to check on the brothers, they're quite some distance away, many miles away, tending the sheep, the flock. Uh, so he sent them out to check on it. So they saw him quite some distance away. Hard to miss him in that they're a colored coat, right? So they said, here comes that dreamer. Let's seize hold of him and kill him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams then. And uh, the oldest, it's important little side note here, uh, Reuben, uh, he had a suggestion. No, no, let's not kill him. Let's, can it, let's just throw him into this pit and then let him die on his own, uh, you know, there. Now you might say, well, that's not nice either. Except his intent was to come back later, rescue the boy and bring him back to his father. So when, they, when he got close, they seized him, they threw him into the pit, and, and Reuben was not there when the, the next scene happens because they're all sitting down having lunch and they see a band of uh, Ishmaelite traders, Midianites, coming from Gilead on their way to Egypt. And so Judah says, what profit is there if we just kill him? Let's, let's sell him. Let's make some money off the thing at least, you know. And uh, so let's sell him as a slave. So they, they came upon this idea. When the Midianite traders, traders came, they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. And, and he was then brought down to Egypt where he then was purchased by Potiphar, who was captain of the bodyguard. Now that brings us to chapter 39, beginning in verse one. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, so that he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. 
So Jacob found favor in his sight. Now let's stop there for a moment because it's important to see in verse two where he says the Lord was with Joseph. Now that is an interesting thing because you're gonna see the favor of God. As he's in Potiphar's house, everything he does is blessed. He's got like the, the golden hand. The favor of God is so clearly evident. He's just being blessed upon blessed. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. What, is it? what do you mean the Lord was with Joseph? Where was the Lord when his brothers betrayed him? Where was the Lord when his brothers sold him into slavery? Where was the Lord then? See, now, it's important that you recognize that the, the Lord's favor upon us does not mean that there won't be troubles in our lives. Jesus said, in this world, you will have many troubles. But take courage, I've overcome the world. So it, you see, that's important to recognize because it doesn't mean Christians, being a Christian does not mean that, that evil will not befall you does not mean that you will be, you know, shielded and protected from anything going wrong in your life. It does not mean that. What it does mean is that God will be with you in the midst of the troubles. He walks with us in this troubled world and he strengthens us in the midst of it. It's important to recognize because if you don't see that, you're going to interpret your, your circumstances wrongly. And, and that will lead to a shipwreck of the faith. Many people have shipwrecked their faith, not understanding. And then when things go wrong in their lives, they blame God, they accuse God. Like, where, where are you when I'm in trouble, Lord? Where, where are you now? I thought you cared. Where's the love of God now? And so they begin to misunderstand and then they hold it against God. And when you hold it against God, you're gonna, you're gonna withhold your heart. I tell you what, when you start withholding your heart from God, trouble will come in your life. And so this is an important thing to see, that, that balance of things. He's still got troubles in his life. But here's what's also interesting. What's absolutely interesting to me is, is how God actually works through the troubles to bring about his will. I mean, his purpose is to fulfill those dreams. He is in fact going to see his brothers bow down to him. But God is going to construct even the things that are wrong. God causes all things to work together for good to the, those who love God called according to his purpose. What's interesting is how he uses even those difficulties to bring about uh, his will. It's like victory comes uh, out of troubles. It's like beauty comes out of ashes. God somehow works in the midst of it to bring about that which is glorious to his name. And then you watch when tragedies come in your life. You keep watching for the favor of God, even though you're going through a tragedy, even though you're going through a difficult, you keep watching and you will see God's favor. Make sure that you do not let your heart go bitter. Make sure that you do not accuse God in the midst of it. Now, I can tell you this, I speak from experience. Many of you know my story. Our daughter was murdered four years ago and it brought us to the, 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 the depths of, of a broken heart. I've never cried so much in my life, but I never doubted God. I never was angry with God. I would not blame, I refuse to blame God because he's the one who holds my future in his hand. He's the one who holds my soul for eternity. I do not want to get angry with God because I trust him even in the midst of all the difficulties and the troubles of life. And I've seen many troubles. My father was an alcoholic and abusive, raised in a very, very difficult home. I've seen many, many troubles. And I will tell you that the steadfastness of your faith is the key to the victory. Because as soon as you start getting bitter, you're gonna withhold your heart from God and you withhold your heart from God, you will be very much alone in this world and that you don't want. And so you see the favor of God upon you. It's really an amazing thing. And so the Egyptian sees this, right? And, and his master saw that the Lord, verse three was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in 
Potiphar's side. And he became his personal servant. He, like he brought him to his house and made him his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house. And all that he owned, he put in his charge. And it came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him, with him there, he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now, Joseph, it makes us a note that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Okay, that you understand what we were saying here. He was a young man in his young 20s, and uh, he was young and attractive in form and in face, in appearance. And so it says, it came about, verse seven, that after these events, that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph. And she said, lie with me. She seems pretty bold here. This is just a straight out, uh, you know, there's, there's no coyness to the seduction. She's just telling him straightforwardly, come lie with me. But he refused. Now, here's one of the reasons that Joseph stands out as a hero here. He refuses. And he said to his master's wife, behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. And he's put me, uh, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I. And he has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Now listen to this statement. I repeated it several times. Can we seize hold of this statement? How then can I do this great evil and sin against God? How can I do this thing and sin against God? This is such a remarkable statement. Because here he was. He was completely uh, outside of any accountability. Right? There, no family around. No one to accuse him should he falter. No one to blame him would have been an opportunity for sin. But you've got to just love the steadfastness, not only of his faith, but the steadfastness of his integrity. Do you remember when Job, right? The famous story of Job, so many things were going wrong in his life. And at one point, things got so bad in his life that his wife said to him, do you still hold on to your integrity? Curse God and die, man. What an encouraging wife he had. <laughs> now, now, listen to that question. Do you really, you're still holding on to your, why are you holding on to your integrity? That's really what she's saying. Why are you holding on to your integrity? Can't you see everything that's gone wrong in your life? Why are you holding on? Curse God and die. Get this thing over with. Just curse him and die. And, and then, of course, we love his response. You speak like one of the foolish women. Woman? Well, he didn't quite say it that way, but you know, <laughs> that was the idea. You speak like a foolish woman. And then he says, should we accept good from God and not adversity? Now, that is a really good question. Should we accept good and not adversity? Because that's the way some people are. They, they will only accept good from God. And any adversity, then they accuse or blame God. And so, and it says, and in all of this, Job did not sin. He held on. Now, there's something right about that. And I tell you what, this is interesting because he's a young man in his 20s. I, I dare to say his hormones are pretty up there. Uh, I don't want to get into detail, but you know what I'm saying? He's in his young 20s. I don't want to go on this track. I, have I made my point? And, and he has integrity in spite of his raging hormones. He's got integrity. He has made a standard and he is holding to that standard. You know what we need? We need that kind of integrity in our lives today. Make a standard and hold on to that standard. Here's what, here's what happens. Many people, they don't define it. They don't make a standard. You see, they don't have a line in the sand. 
And see, we need to do that. We need to set a standard and draw a line. This is what I have decided. This is what I have determined. I am standing right here and I will go no farther. That is a determined decision to stand on your integrity. Make a decision and stand on that integrity. Amen? It's it. And then to be able to do that, in, even in secret, even in secret, when no one's watching, he's not doing this to impress anyone. He is doing it because he knows that the eyes of God are on him and he wants to bless his God. How could I sin against my God? How can I do this thing? I'll tell you what, if we could just grab a hold of that. When David sinned, you know, with Bathsheba, you know what he said in, in, in Psalm 51? Against you have I sinned, O God. He recognized that his sin was against the Lord. And so this is important. Have that standard, even when you are in secret. And it will, it will be a great strength to the soul. When you have a line, it strengthens the soul. Because you, right, your decision is made. Your decision is made. You stand on that. And it's, a, it's the integrity of the soul he's speaking to. And it came about, verse 10, that as she spoke to Joseph day after day, that he did not listen to her to lie beside her. So apparently, this is what she was saying. Come just lie down here. Just come lie next to me. You know, what harm could there be in that? Just come lie down here next to me. And he says, that, it says here that he would not lie next to her or even be with her. So now he's got, he got some wisdom. He's like staying away from the whole temptation of the thing. Right now, there's some good lessons here. Amen? There's a time to just stay away. Some people, you know what they do? They see how close they can get to the edge of the cliff. You, you know what I'm saying? We are not to be Christian cliff climbers. That is not what we are called to do. You know how many people fall from rocks? We were just, uh, we were visiting friends in Central Oregon and they took us to see Smith Rock, if anybody's ever been there. And, and there's all these chalk marks where people with their chalk on their hands have climbed the, these cliffs. And, uh, and so I, I, I saw a little, a uh, few handholds about that far off the ground. And so I said to my wife, uh, go down real low with my camera and make it look like I'm climbing. <laughs> That's as far as I want to go. Because I found out later that they're taking bodies out of Smith Rock all the time. When you play in the cliff, something's going to go wrong sometime. And see, we're not called to be Christian cliff climbers. There's a time to stay away. Don't see how close you can go. You make a decision and then you stay from that line. You stay clear of that. And that's the example that we have. He did not even lie beside her and he would not even be with her. Now, it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and it just so happened that none of the men of the household was there inside. So she caught him by his garment and then she said, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled. So she like, she wouldn't let go. She had a hold of his, of his garment and she wouldn't let go. So he wrestled himself out of his garment and left it and he ran. There's a time to flee. You know, generally speaking, to run is a sign of weakness. To run is a sign of, of cowardice, normally. But there's a time to run and it shows great courage and strength of integrity. There's a time to run and there's something like that's a time to run. And he understands that. So he, he gets out of there. But what's interesting, it says that when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, that she called to the men of the household. And she said to, to, to them, see, he has brought in this Hebrew to make sport of us. And he came in to lie with me and I screamed. And it came about when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed that he left his garment beside me and he fled and he went outside. She's just lying straight up. 
So she left his garment beside her until his master came home, making sure that nobody touched that. Then she spoke to, she spoke to him with these words. Now that Hebrew slave whom you brought to us, she says to her, her husband, he came in to me to make sport with me. He attempted to rape me. And it happened as I raised my voice and screamed that he left his garment beside me and he fled outside. And it came about when his master heard the words of his wife, which she had spoken to him, she, saying, this is what your slave did to me, that his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, uh, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And there he was in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph. He nevertheless suffered the false accusation. Have you ever, have you ever been falsely accused? It does not feel good. Because especially if it's believed and you know, you know that it isn't so, but it's believed. Oh, it, it hurts. What do you do? What do you do when it seems like there's this unrelenting wave against you? What do you do? I remember when I was uh, a teenager and my uh, uh, good friend um, who was, uh, you know, he'd been through his own troubles and he was a foster child. And uh, so he was living in, in, in this town that was on the way to my house. And, and uh, we st I stopped at his house many times and visited him and knew his foster dad and, and uh, you know, had a good relationship with all of them. And one day I was coming through town. Uh, I was, okay, honestly, I was hitchhiking. Back in those days, you know, a little different. And I was hitchhiking and I was coming through town and I needed to use the bathroom, like really badly. And so I thought, well, his house is just, you know, a couple blocks away. So I went over to his house, knocked on the door, no one was there. And so I, I checked the door and it was open. So I went into the house, used the bathroom and closed the door and left. And I went on to, to home. Later that evening, my friend called me. And he said, did you come by the house today? I said, yeah, I had to use the bathroom. And I uh, stopped, the house was open, so I used the bathroom. And thank you very much. And he said, there is a scientific calculator missing. And so my foster dad is like, who took that? You know, the, back in those days, a scientific calculator was you know, very expensive. And, and like... He's convinced you took that. I said, well, tell him I didn't. Because I didn't. And he said, I don't think he's going to believe that. I said, well, sure he will. Of course he will. <laughs> we're, we're talking about me here. Of course he will. Just tell him I didn't do it. He knows me. So he puts the phone down and I hear some yelling in the background. And he comes back and he says, he doesn't believe you and you are not allowed in this house or on this property ever again. I said, really? Well, that's just not right. That's what he said. I said, okay. And so it just burned. It's like, well, I didn't deserve, I didn't, I really didn't take the calculator. What do you do? What do you do? What can you do? I can't change his mind. You know what you do when things are against you? You walk in integrity. That's what you do. You just keep walking. You keep walking straightforwardly with integrity. God, I don't know where this is going. But I do know this, that you are sovereign over all things. You know, I was a young man. But I had faith, something, something of faith was in me to believe that somehow God works all things out, that somehow God keeps track of all accounts, that God settles all accounts. Do you believe that? God said, you, so my faith said, I'm, I didn't do it, I'm innocent. I'm just gonna walk steadfast. And so whenever uh, we came near his house, 
and he needed to go in for something or other, I would wait on the other side of the street and I would just, uh, you know, lean against the telephone pole just waiting for him to get done with whatever and out he would come and we would go on our way and uh, do this and that. And then I started to drive, got my own car. And uh, one day, this went on for months and then years. And one day we're, we're driving and we're driving down the road and he says, oh, I see my dad. I, I wanna stop and say hi. And so I really don't want to stop and say hi. And he said, well, I, I, I just wanna say hi. I just wanna say hi real quick. And I said, okay. So we pulled over and he rolls down the window and he's, you know, hi, dad, what are you doing? Da, 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 da. And I'm just... I'm not mad, I'm not gonna get even, I'm just gonna steadfastly walk. So I just waited and he, okay, see you later, bye. Then later he called me and he said, my dad wants to tell you something. I said, really what? He wants to tell you that he's sorry, he misjudged your character. We found the calculator. Where was it? Oh, it was somehow falling behind the couch and they were moving furniture and there it was. Interestingly, his dad never said that to me personally. Moving on. Have you ever had a circumstance though where you're going through and you're suffering? You're just suffering. You can't change it. But what do you do? So this is important. Because sometimes when people can't change it, they get angry, they get frustrated, and they start letting go of their integrity. No, you hold on to your integrity and you walk steadfastly even if you're suffering. You hold steadfastly. Now, I say that and I wanna add a caution. I wanna add a caution because sometimes people will misinterpret what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that you suffer in every single circumstances. If you can do something, do something. Okay, I wanna say that because somebody's gonna hear me and they're gonna say, my husband is abusing me and you're telling me to just keep suffering? No, I didn't say that. If your husband's abusing you, this is a time to say no more, amen? I'm not saying that. I'm talking about if you're falsely accused or uh, there are circumstances where you can't change it, but you know you must walk. That's what I'm talking about. So it says that it came about that he cast him into this prison and Joseph's master put him into the jail, verse 20, the place where the king's prisoners were confined and he was there in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The favor of the Lord. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Now, this is an aspect of our faith, to believe that the favor of God is upon you. See, do you believe that the favor of God, if you name the name of Jesus in your life, do you believe that the favor of God is upon you? See, you must understand that indeed the favor of God is upon those whose hearts are with him, right? Second Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the whole earth in order to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are completely his. That's a great verse. Second Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in their behalf for those whose hearts are completely his. Do you believe the favor of God is on you? If you believe that the favor of God is on you, 
then you will look with anticipation for that favor. God, I believe that your favor is on me. I will wait and I will watch because I believe that you will indeed bless my life. I will wait and I will watch for I believe that you are the blesser of my life. Notice how I said that, I will wait. For those who wait for the Lord will rise up with wings like eagles and they will run and not faint and they'll walk and not get tired. That, that is a promise. Those who wait for the Lord and watch and anticipate the favor of God. Chapter 40, verse one. Then it came about after these things that the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their Lord, the king of Egypt. So Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard. What did they do to offend them? It does not say. Probably wasn't something as small as he burnt the, you know, toast. Probably something, there was a plot against him perhaps and he wanted to investigate. The cupbearer would have been one of the closest ones to the king and the, the baker was one of those who prepared the food for the king. And if there was ever assassination, one of them might be involved. So perhaps an investigation, so he put him in prison while this investigation took place, perhaps. And it says that the cupbearer was put into, and the chief baker were put into confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, same place where Joseph was in prison, verse four. And the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them and he took care of them and they were in confinement for some time. Years are going by, years. Sometimes you, you, you go through steadfastness of suffering for years. Then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night. Each man with his own dream, each dream with his own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. And he asked Pharaoh's officials who were with them in confinement in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? Why are your faces so sad today? Now, I find that interesting because, I mean, they're in prison. There's lots of reasons to be sad. But Joseph's countenance himself is not sad. Like, he, he's there to, to help them, to lift them up, to encourage them. Why are you so sad today? I, I just find this amazing in, in the sense that Joseph himself was not sad. You know, it's like, you know, remember that, that psalm where David spoke to his own soul and he said to his own soul, why are you so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God, man. You know, he's speaking to his own soul. And I, you can see that encouragement in Joseph himself. Like he's, he's going through, he's, he's in prison and he's, you know, he's in this, this terrible uh, place and yet his countenance is lifted up. I tell you, there's an example. There's this example of just that even his countenance is lifted up. And so he says to them, why are you so downcast? Why are your faces so sad? And they said to him, because we've had a dream and there's no one to interpret it. So then Joseph says, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and he said to them, him, in my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me and on the vine were three branches and it was budding. Its blossoms came out and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. So I took the grapes and I squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and then I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. So Joseph said, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and he will restore you, that's an expression, and will restore you to your office and you will, be, you, will, you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. But keep me in mind when it goes well with you and please do me this kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews and even here, I have done nothing. Would you notice that he didn't throw his brothers under the bus there? 
They didn't have buses in those days. <laughs> so he didn't, couldn't do that. But even here, I have done nothing that they should have put me in the dungeon. He doesn't even throw Potiphar's wife under the bus. Then the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, uh, favorably. So he said to Joseph, well, I also saw in my dream and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. And in the top basket, there were some of all sorts of bread, uh, baked food for Pharaoh and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. So then Joseph answered and he said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head but he will take your head from you and he will hang you on a tree and the birds will eat your flesh off of you. To which you might say, well, he could have said that a little nicer. <laughs> but here's the thing. He's giving all of this detail for a reason. For when this dream is fulfilled, it confirms in fact that he has been given the gift of interpreting these dreams. The confirmation of that is going to become key to the story. Thus it came about, verse 20, on the third day, which, by the way, was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all of his servants. And he, this is the expression, he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and he lifted up the chief, the head of the chief baker among his servants. But he did it, did it in two different ways. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph interpreted. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Now, verse chapter 41, verse one, now it happened at the end of two more years. Two more years. How long could you stand to suffer? without compromising your integrity? Could you just continue to be steadfast in your determination to hold on to your integrity? That's why Joseph is such an amazing example. Two more years, Pharaoh then had a dream. And behold, this is the dream. He was standing by the Nile and lo, from the Nile, there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly, gaunt. And they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. Then he fell asleep again, and he dreamed a second time. Two dreams. Behold, now the second dream. Seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump, good. Then, behold, seven ears thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now it came about in the morning that his spirit was greatly troubled. So he sent and he called all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dreams. And there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh. He, then he remembered he says, I would make mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, a Hebrew youth was with us there and a ser he was a servant of the captain of the bodyguard and we related our dreams to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came about that just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, but Pharaoh hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it, and I've Heard it said that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph then answered Pharaoh, and he said, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Would you notice now the humility that he has? 
you can see his character changing. He gives God all the glory. The humility on Joseph comes through. And that, that humility is important to have for every one of us to recognize that anything we have, God gave it. And that humility is such an absolutely wondrous key. You see, however, this transformation of his character growing even in depth. Even though he was a man of character in his young 20s, he is growing in depth in his character, even as he grows older. God is the one who will give you an answer. So Pharaoh, verse 17, spoke to Joseph, in my dream, behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. Behold, seven cows, fat and sleek, came up from the Nile. They were grazing in the marsh grass. Behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor, very ugly and gaunt, such as I have never seen for ugliness in all the land of Egypt. And the lean and the ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. Yet when they had devoured them, it could not be detected that they had devoured them, for they were just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. I also, I saw also in my dream, behold, seven ears, full and good, came up in a single stock, lo, seven ears withered, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And the thin ears swallowed the seven good ears. Then I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. So Joseph then said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. The seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one and the same. And the seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven thin ears scorched by the east wind, seven years. But there's seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will come and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine will ravage the land. So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of the subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. Now, as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that this matter is determined by God and God will quickly bring it about. Now, let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce. This is like a 20% tax. Really was not bad compared to some other countries' taxes. <clears throat> and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up the grain for the, uh, for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. And let the food become as a reserve for the land of the seven years of famine, which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish during the famine. Now, the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and all the servants. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? We would say, who is filled with the Holy Spirit. He didn't understand that. So Pharaoh then said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and according to your command, all my people will do homage. Only in the throne, I will be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it in Joseph's hand. This is the authority of that ring and clothed him in garments of fine linen, put the golden necklace around his neck and he made him ride in a second chariot. And they proclaimed before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh named Joseph. He changed his name, Zaphnath paneah which very likely, we don't know exactly what it means, but it very likely could mean God speaks and he lives. Uh, interesting name. And he gave him Azanath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So he gave her as his wife. 
So he had an Egyptian wife. And Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. Now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. And during the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of these seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt and placed the food in the cities and he placed in every city the food from his own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it for it was beyond measure. Let's stop there. Father, thank you so much for your gracious hand on our lives. God, I pray that we would read through this story with a heart to discern the application for each one of us. For I pray for every person in this room that they would make a decision in their heart determined to hold on to their integrity and to trust you that your hand will be upon them even in times of adversity or difficulty or trouble. Your favor, nevertheless, will reside on each person who trusts in you with all of their heart, who loves God and looks toward the favor of God. And I pray for every person in this room would be, would be strengthened in their faith to trust you. And church tonight, I don't know what trouble, I don't know what difficulty that you may be going through, but I will ask you, will you hold on to your faith and will you hold on to your integrity and trust that God will make a way through the trouble? Do you believe that God will? I'm gonna ask that you would say this to the Lord tonight. I have determined in my heart, God, that I will hold on to my integrity, I will hold on to my faith, and I will look for the favor of the hand of God on my life. Would you say that to the Lord? I'm gonna ask you to just raise your hand and say it to the Lord. I will hold on to my integrity, I will hold on to my faith, and I will look at your hand that will bless even in the midst of this adversity. Father, thank you for every hand raised, everyone who looks to you in faith, everyone who trusts and believes that you never leave us and never forsake us, but you are steadfastly with us, even in the times of trouble. Your favor nevertheless resides upon us and we want to recognize you and to praise you and to give you thanks and to give you honor for all that you have done and are doing and will do in our lives. We recognize that as we give you praise. In Jesus' name, and everyone said,